through archive film from the Centre of East Anglian Studies at the University of East Anglia, we are able to look back at life in the county, how we worked and lived and played, in town and country, in city and village. We start at Yarmouth. It's autumn, 1902, and steam drifters and sailing drifters are coming back from the fishing grounds. On the quay, it's all hustle and bustle, and the Scottish fisher girls are about. But at the moment, they're only doing some knitting. Here they're counting fish in long hundreds. This is before the quarter crown basket became the main measurement. After the auction, the fish had to be gutted. And this is where the Scottish fisher girls came into their own, for they worked exceedingly fast, gutting about one fish a second. Then they had to pack them into barrels, for at this time about 80% of the catch went overseas. As we skip round the region, we have a brief look at Norwich. We're on the top of a tram, travelling down the Deerham Road. This was before the days of cinemas, and this little film was taken to include in a cinematograph show, shown locally. Norwich City Football Club in action now, and the year is 1913. But this is not at the nest in Norwich where they used to play, for this was an away cup match with Leicester Foss, which the city won 4-1. The original match five days earlier had been abandoned after 65 minutes because of a blizzard, and the weather doesn't look too good at this week's match. Ah, a goal. Not match of the day coverage, I'm afraid. A pheasant shoot now, somewhere in the Norfolk countryside, in 1913. This man's pretty busy, and so is his loader. This lady's having a go. I think she's got cold hands. She certainly hasn't got cold feet. And here's the bag laid out. And now some scenes at Hall Farm, Topcroft, near Wyndham, filmed by a student in 1927. The camera used was a small 9.5 machine, which had only been introduced a few years before. But the cameraman used the camera well, and gives us a wonderful chance to look back at agriculture before the days of mechanisation, when everything was done by horsepower and hand labour. Scything round the crop to get the binder in. And tying the sheaves up with straw bonds. The binder here is pulled by three horses. The man on the back not only controlled the horses, but also made sure that the sheaves coming out were properly tied. Sheep dipping time now. I'm not quite sure whether the poor old sheep's enjoying it or not.
docking now, 1927, and this is the water cart from which many people got their water for drinking and cooking. Rainwater was used for washing. They had to buy the water here at a halfpenny a pail, and it later went up to a penny a pail. When the water tower was built and taps became available, they only had one tap per lane. Jumping around the region, we now visit Thetford. We're in the yard of the Anchor Hotel in Bridge Street. The cameraman has gone along with the group to some sort of outing. He filmed the cars and then the street with a long, slow pan between the two. Perhaps all his friends are in the bar. a garage, and then a fairly deserted street. They're off now on their outing, and this man has taken on the job of directing traffic. Well, not much of a job, you would think, as there's not much going along Bridge Street, but there is at least one car. Well, I wonder where they're all going. Perhaps they're going to the seaside. This is Trimmingham, a little amateur film, people just enjoying themselves in the sea and on the beach. When the fishermen wanted to get their crab boats up the beach, they put the oars through the auric holes and carried the boat. Walsingham now, in the mid-1930s. The deserted streets soon fill up when the pilgrimages take place. On foot they come, on bicycles, in motor cars, by train and by motor coach. Once again, Wallisingham is the greatest pilgrimage centre in England. There are great processions, the like of which may be seen nowhere else in this country. And now a place that doesn't seem to have changed very much, Blakeney in the 1930s. The tide always seems to be out at Blakeney, but when it is in, there are trips to the point to look at the birds. This is a little record made by a filmmaker visiting Norfolk in 1938. Down the coast to Cromer now, the crab fishermen are bringing in their catch. And here's that most famous of lifeboatmen, Henry Blogg. The area around Cromer was known as Poppyland. This was popularised when the railways came, and people came here for a quiet holiday. They could visit some of the North Norfolk villages, or visit the famous broads close by. With the sun shining in this 1938 film, it all seems idyllic. But in fact, it had been a very difficult winter, for the sea had broken through at Horsey and flooded acres of land. The flood occurred on February the 13th, following a northerly gale and a very high tide. The sea also broke through at Cly, and at Walcott, the road was undermined. Over at Blickling, there was a great deal of fun and pageantry at Nugent Monk's The Mask of Anne Boleyn. 
This was performed in front of the hall in August 1938. This outdoor play was first performed in 1909 and then again in 1925. The same filmmaker who filmed at Blickling then shot these scenes somewhere in Norfolk of aeroplanes, albeit old ones, on one of the new aerodromes. They give a sinister reminder of the war to come as they lift off into the Norfolk sky. The late 1940s was a bleak time, not helped by the heaviest fall of snow for 50 years. The weather was so severe that the Waveney froze and people were able to skate for the first time since 1894 from Alton to Beckles. Close by Worsted ran the North Walsham and Dillham Canal. This was badly damaged by the 1912 flood and never operated properly again. The small wherries that used this canal carried freights of every imaginable kind, as one of the old wherrymen, Arthur Waters, remembers. Grain, flour, coal. We once had a very peculiar freight, freight of toils. We didn't know when I was loading the toys, we broke up some of them. They never said not. My father used to go right to Antingham. Where I never been far as Swayfield stayed. There were three wherries used to go right up to Antingham. My, my uh, aunt, Mrs. Lana, she had one, the Victor. Mr. Horsfield had one, Shepherd, I think her name was. And there was another wherry, little wherry, it's called a cabbage wherry. She was only 12 tons. Used to take vegetables down to Yarn Market. 
Another wherryman who worked the broads, this time in the 1930s, was Nat Bircham. They say the good old days, but they weren't good old days really, I suppose, but I, I enjoyed it. But I remember in 1928, when I was first married, I have been married a couple of years. I was all alone on a worry, counting sugar beet, up to horsey stays and Red Mill Dyke on Barton Broad, and um, Catfield Dyke. And um, Dillon, just uh, just below Dillon Lark, just through Tunnish Bridge, and uh, I was all alone on all worry, and I had a very hard winter that one. I I used to get twenty five tons of freight cart. I used to load load it by hand. I used to get tons of tons of loading them, and I used to wheel them sometimes at thirty or forty feet over the river, get me to, get them on board. But the total money I got was twenty twenty five tons of freight. To Cantley. I used to do two a week, and uh, my average was 1928. I've got records up somewhere. I was working seven days a week, 18 hours a day on average, and uh, I think my money's about four and something an hour. Peace work. I used to take all, every time I had to go up there, I'd take the keel off because I draw too much water. Then when I got down below Ludden Bridge, I used to ha hang on the bank and fiddle about and get the keel on again. Sometimes it used to take us hours. So it take me hours to get on. My hands would be rimming numb. The trading wherries died out in the 1930s, but in 1949 the Norfolk Wherry Trust was formed with the object of preserving a wherry on the broads. The result was the Albion, which is still used for training and recreational cruises. This is Horsted Mill in the 1940s, when it was still a working water mill. In the cold winter of 1963, a rat gnawed through a cable, so they say, and the mill caught fire and burnt down. It used to be a beauty spot on the broads, which holiday makers came to see. To entice people to the broads for a holiday, this publicity film was made around 1950. Gliding smoothly up the sun-kissed waters of the Bure, past many riverside dwellings, some of them quaint like this converted windmill. Past lovely gardens bright with flowers, green velvety lawns surrounding miniature lagoons, where water lilies lift their lovely faces to the sun. On towards Horning, the river is gay with pleasure craft, where years ago, only the huge sailed wherries plied their trade between the coast and the inland towns and villages. The ferry has been a river crossing for over a thousand years. After becoming nearly extinct, the voice of the bittern can occasionally be heard, booming his love song over the nearby marshes, and the rare swallow-tailed butterfly is sometimes seen amongst the flowers in Horning's garden. Butterflies of a different kind also revel in the warm sunshine and cool waters. And after a really hard morning's work, doing nothing in particular, the right place always seems to come into view at the right time. The peaceful charms of some of the small broads lying close by provide a pleasant contrast to the bustle and activity of the river. Just the place for a bay. Come on in, the water's lovely. In the spacious grounds of Middleton Towers in Norfolk, a motorcycle grass track was recently opened, and to perform the opening ceremony came George Formby and his wife, Beryl. Turned out nice again, said George. Running an expert eye over a bike, George is overcome by an irresistible urge, and an expectant crowd see him suddenly throw a leg over the saddle, and he's off. wasn't even challenged as he roared round the track and established such a lead 
that he walked the last lap, says Petrol, and finished up the easiest winner of the day. Receiving the prize he had so bravely earned, George suitably dealt with it, and like all good boys at the fete, was given a flag, in fact several flags, and spent the afternoon waving them at the riders. Down goes the flag, and they're off. Oh, my golly, that was a nasty one. Hurt spills add to the excitement as the riders go hurtling round the track. Thank you very much. Believe me, it gives me great pleasure to give you this. And I really wish you the best of luck with it. Thank you very much. Now, what are you going to do with this? Go inside. I'll give it to my wee laddie. Oh, you're going to give it to your wee laddie. Very nice, too. Thank you very much. Have a nice drink out there. Lovely. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much. And look what was coming over here. Very nice. Isn't that lovely? Very nice. From this, this is from Middleton. All right, now, will you just wait a minute? And there you are, with my love. Thank you. Would you like one, too, sir? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be featured in this film. I believe it's the first one of its kind that's been produced on 16 millimeter, especially for rural. Did I say that right? Rural, <laughs> rural districts. And I'd like to take this opportunity of wishing the producers and the sponsors of it the best of luck, because it's a new thing and everybody has to have a start. But we've had a good day to start it with because it's really turned out nice again, hasn't it? There was a time when children took part in harvest, and a valuable part at that. But nowadays, down on the farm, it's almost dangerous to do so. These scenes were taken around 1950 on Old Hall Farm, Stifke, where Henry Williamson once farmed. Here they're thrashing out, and they've got a tractor to drive the drum. When there was thrashing to be done, they worked all day, from early in the morning till nearly dusk, for they had to take advantage of the tackle being available. The large sacks of grain were known as coons, and with wheat weighed up to 18 stone. Mr. J. Nash of Manor Farm, Little Melton, keeps a TT freezing herd. He normally has 30 to 40 cows and heifers in the milking herd, and they average over a thousand gallons. These are the type of animal which Mr. Nash is breeding. Young stock are always done well. They are reared on a milk replacer type of calf food, and are given a generous concentrate allowance. Concentrates are continued until at least 12 months. Calves are not normally turned out until they are six months of age at the earliest. This group of yearlings is being yarded for the night.
The herd is milked twice daily. Six cows can be milked at a time. The milking is done with conventional vacuum buckets. Feeding is also on conventional lines. As much use as possible is made of the bulky homegrown foods such as hay, kale, sugar beet tops and so on. And this type of food plus oats or sugar beet pulp is fed for maintenance and the first gallon. For production above the first gallon, balanced dairy nuts are fed. Mangles and kale are two of the crops which Mr. Nash grows. Kale is generally folded with an electric fence. A certain amount of cabbage is also grown. This is approximately equal to kale in feeding value. Milk is cooled in the dairy using an in-churn type of cooler. After milking, cows go into the collecting yard and so out to pasture again. Supplies of fresh water are essential. It should be realized that a cow requires three to four gallons of water for each gallon of milk produced. Good grassland means that it is only necessary to feed supplementary concentrates to the high yielding cows. Generally, summer dairy nuts are used for this purpose. Mr. Nash and his sons have built up a high yielding herd they believe in vigorous culling to improve the herd average. Many of these Norfolk village signs were made by Harry Carter. This is the Swapham one being unveiled. Harry Carter was art master at Hammond School in Swapham. We visit Brook now with a film made in the 1950s and Mrs Folkes is going to talk us round. This is the old village hall which was an army hut and there was a very fearsome district nurse who, who ran a clinic and you can see how little traffic there was because the mums are pushing the prams up the road. Um, all the mums met at this clinic. It's a clinic, the mums are taking their children to the clinic to have them weighed, um, checks, hearing checks and that kind of thing. They used to hold this clinic every every month, I think, and check on the children, and they have them now. Ah, haymaking in a field between the main road and the village itself. Um, this is no longer done, of course, in the village, um, and there are houses now on this field. Bus stop, King's Head, the old garage, um, on your right, a cottage which is still there, a barn which has now been converted into housing. The road's been widened here, so it doesn't look quite the same. Earlier in the century, there was a tea garden opposite the village um, pub, where people took tea and played bowls. Oh, much bigger, busier now, yes. Through traffic to Bernard Matthews Chicken Farms. This is interesting. This is Mr Copping the Saddler. Uh, Brooke in the 50s had a working saddler and a working um, smith. In fact, he was the, the, the blacksmith was there until oh, 80s. When he retired, there was no one to take it over. And the saddler displayed his wares outside his shop. He made things to order. It's no longer functioning, but it's still called Saddler's Cottage. This is Mr Roper, a village character who ran the garage. He repaired everything, bicycles, lawnmowers, cars. His garage was the most incredible muddle. Um, this is the forge where Mr Crossy was still working. This is going to the village shop 
now a private house. In those days it was still thatched, now the tile the thatch has been taken off, it's tiled. General stores, um, drapery, um, gardening equipment, everything. They even had a bakery there and they baked the bread in the bakehouse at the back of the shop for the whole of the village. These were the very new council houses which are now um, very much desire, desired, built by um, Taylor and Green. This is fascinating. This was a superb old barn alongside the churchyard and we had this farm in the centre of the village. There's the church tower you see just beyond the farmyard. And uh, beside the farm were the old kitchen gardens derelict of the old hall. And they used to drive these cows up and down the village street. This is the churchyard which contains a very interesting um, tombstone here. A woman who came and stayed in Brook, people were so kind to her that she asked to be um, buried there. And she was treated with much kindness and uh, was here interred. And here are the cows coming out of the farmyard and actually up the village street. Quite impossible now and that beautiful barn has been demolished. Um, this is interesting, you see it's still pretty rural. Children um, working on the school garden, somebody taking their horse to be, pony to be shod, just opposite the school. Interestingly, the school gave up gardening, but they now have a conservation area and they're all working like mad on the same plot of land that you saw in that film. Postman, down in the village. But it's so empty, isn't it? The barn there has now been made into a house, the barn on the left. And this, I think, must be the Women's Institute gathering at the old village hall. We now have a posh new field and a Mawson one. I don't know what they were doing, whether they were going on an outing or what it was, I don't know. You might get a bed. Oh, you might get a bed at Woolworths. Bum, 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 bum. The spinster prayed her maiden's prayer. She shouted out in her despair. Oh, shall I never get a thrill? And her parrot said, well, cheer up. Perhaps you will. You might get one at Woolworths. At Woolworths. Just for luck, some nail beak or horse is on the door. Some are wearing heather in their coat for four. Some wear down, so large and small. I don't think it matters if there's nothing on at all. Everybody's grumbling, grumbling, grumbling. Everybody's grumbling, grumbling all the day. Some can't write and others can't spell. Some in politics, they think they sell. We've known the six in the asylum as well. And all I've got to say, is everybody grumbling, 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 keep on grumbling. I would sit there in the gloom of my lonely little room and applaud each time you whispered, I love you, love you, on the screen the moment you came in view. We would talk the whole thing over, we do. I'm glad to have this opportunity of speaking to you on the subject of air raid precautions so far as it affects our own ancient city. We are concerned with the organization of passive defense against the horrors of aerial bombardment. The city council may have under consideration schemes for the protection of the public moving about the city. Careful thought has been given to the possibility of providing trenches, blast-proof shelters or reinforced basements in vital and highly congested areas. The city authorities are determined to do their part as far as they can within the framework of the government regulations. But they can only do this with the wholehearted support 
of the general public. Run, adult, run, adult, run, run, run. Look what you've been born and done, done, done. We will not burn nothing out of you. All back up the ring and gobble too. You lose your place in the sun, sun, sun. Then you poor dog, you get non, non, non. You soon stop with heaven rinse and drop. So run, adult, run, adult, get out of it. <laughs> You may wonder where all these men are rushing to. Well, they're members of the Wyndham Fire Brigade. This film, entitled On Call, was made around 1960 by David Pohl, who takes us through the film. Well, they had to be there within four minutes. And what are you doing now? You've gone up Broder Street heading for the old 1882 station. When you get at the station, they gave you, gave you the message of where the fire is, all the telephone, which you'll see in a minute. That was a direct line from, from the station to headquarters. 
this here. You know, like that be all the water tender or whatever to such and such an address. There's always a duplicate message left so that anybody coming into the station after they've gone, they know where they are. A normal crew is five, but you can ride up to seven. That's MVF241. That's an A-type water tender which told a trailer pump. But the actual incident that we used on the film was between Wyndham and Long Stratton. As you're running out lengths of hose from the main pump. That would last you a quarter or 20 minutes, but after that time you then need to set in a hydrant. You could either do that straight at the eye of the main pump or use a featherweight to feed the main pump. Or that matter, you could go in a pond or anything, you'd take the featherweight anywhere. Two men can carry it. It's called a featherweight pump, but it isn't really. <laughs> they get a set fee for attending the fire, any, any, which ha well, you know, can be any any time you like. They're on duty 24 hours a day, 52 weeks in the year, but they're only required. They only pay them when they want them. You may only get one a week, or you may get one a month. Or you may be like, us get 21 in one day. <laughs> but that's our exception. I suppose on average we get four or five a week anyway. A few miles from Great Witchingham, on high, open ground at the village of Western Longville, stands a former Liberator airfield on which has been created one of the largest poultry farms in the world. Some 300 acres, 100 of which are concrete, have been adapted to produce upwards of a quarter of a million killing turkeys annually and to house a proportion of the 20,000 breeding hens upon whose output the year-round dispatch of Norfolk Manor turkeys is based. Breeding hens and stags are kept during their laying season in small folds from which eggs are collected five times daily. Were a single poultry woman to attempt this task, she would walk from fold to fold in a day no less than 15 miles. The necessity to mark each egg at the time of collection adds responsibility to this simple duty. The staff on this farm must possess talents well above average, and a training scheme linked with bonus payments according to the grade of skill achieved is in operation. Fresh grass forms an important part of the diet of outside breeding stock. Special transporters make light work of the daily moving of foals, and a systematic pattern of movement ensures that the sward is grazed once all over each 40 days. Turkeys for killing are accommodated according to age in open yards, which may, at one time, present the unique sight of 100,000 turkeys grouped together. Associated growers and breeders maintain Matthews trained turkeys all over Norfolk and Suffolk, serviced from headquarters by trained staff equipped with a modern transport fleet. This separation of its component parts is a very considerable insurance against disease risks, so that only an outbreak of calamitous proportions could bring to a halt for more than a brief period the highly organized Matthews Group Farms. This is what George Cushing's collection of traction engines steam rollers, ploughing engines, portable engines, steam lorries and other steam equipment looked like before these machines were restored and became part of the Thurstford collection that we know today. This balance plough with nettles growing through it and the two ploughing engines that pulled it were demonstrated occasionally to show how steam ploughing worked. This was at Raynham in 1964. 
In the 1960s, steam engine rallies became popular. One of the most regular meetings of enthusiasts and traction engines was at Woodton. The Norfolk coast has always been a treacherous place for shipping. This is the Jeanne that came ashore at Munsley in 1969 and never sailed again. She was broken up. This ship was luckier. She ran aground in Wells Harbour but refloated on the next big tide. But the dependence which came ashore in Holcombe Bay had to be unloaded first. Believe it or not, this French trawler that came ashore at Waxham in 1955 was refloated. But the story behind this disabled barge being towed into Yarmouth by the paddle tug United Service is unknown. There were many more lifeboat stations at one time along the Norfolk coast than there are today. The Wells lifeboat station is still going strong, but here's a film made of the lifeboat there in 1961. David Cox, the coxswain of the lifeboat then, tells us about a shipwreck he remembers. Another rescue the, the Sizzle Pang went to was um, a coal ship bound for London. She ra ran into trouble with an easterly gale, and uh, Sizzle Pang uh, had to go to this ship because they'd lost the skipper over the side, and she was in a very sorry plight. And uh, when the lifeboat got there, the sharing of the lifeboat was alongside, ready to take the crew off. We had to take the uh, skipper off, which had drowned, he was drowned. And um, the, the ship eventually sank, only about four or five miles off Wells. But all the crew were saved. So that, that's another rescue that Sussel Payne took part in with the sharing lifeboat. What you're looking at now is Ladbrook's Caister Holiday Camp, just up the road from Great Yarmouth. That's the beauty queen, by the way. The great thing about Caister is that it's got so much to do for the whole family. Look at that beach. What kid wouldn't have a ball out there? All that sand to play on and the good old briny to splash about us. And talking of splashing about, there's two heated swimming pools if the sea doesn't take your fancy, a brand new covered one, and a super one you're looking at. There's all kinds of entertainments going on all the time. Yes, it's the 1972 holiday season, and the advertisers are getting us to go to the East Coast for our summer holidays. Donkeys still racing, are they? That one's a bit slow. Never mind, dear. Talking of donkeys, I could talk the hind leg off one any day, and there's plenty of chance to do just that down at Caster. Lots of people to talk to, and they talk the same language. I made lots of mates there last year. Everybody was knocked out with the accommodation and all the arrangements. The chalets are smashing. They're really well thought out, aren't they? A number of them are self-catering. And you won't need to worry about where you'll buy the grub. It's all there, right on your doorstep. And there are restaurants and snack bars galore to give you plenty of variety. The mums there were pretty pleased with what they found, I can tell you. Things like a nappy service and babysitters. Well, it gives them a chance to go out in the evenings and have a bit of fun themselves. Well, I wonder where they went. Perhaps they went to a cinema, but I doubt whether they went to this one, the Regal North Walsham, for it was about to become a car showroom. This is the cinema that was in the middle of Fakenham. It was quite popular with youngsters, but this is the last audience to go in and see a film show, for in 1976 it closed. Now we visit the home of Walter Smalls, basket maker of North Creek. 
This was filmed in 1976. This is a good game played slow, you know. You ain't talking about playing a good game slow. <laughs> I put corners on to you. Get you on the neck. See? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Now, see, I got plenty of worries. Nice and grey, huh? I had girls come here, they say, that's a wig, I know that's a wig, oh, you pull it then. And no man your age don't have black hair. <laughs> Listen, my man, oh, you're hollow there, aren't you? Ah, you're beautiful. Come on, oh, you're down, you are. I left school when I was 12, and I've been working seven days a week ever since. I like work. I mean, I am forced to do this. You all understand that? See? Well, you've got to make a living, haven't you? No. I mean, I, I shouldn't be 80. Really? No, I'm very strong. Yeah. I carried a tree, uh, weighed 500 weight, quarter ton. Carried? Hmm, carried on my show. Yes. No day too long for me. No work too hard or too dirty. I don't know tell anybody, no. If I can, if I don't intend to work for them, I hide up so they can't find me. I, I'm uh, psychic. I can forecast things will happen. If anything is going to happen, uh, I either see my father and sometimes my father and mother when I sleep bed mm. and uh, the night when my mother died uh, I see my father and I said hello you're back he said yes I can't take mother away from you because she's getting too much trouble for you and she was gone in the morning yeah and that was the 25th of June Exactly ten years after he died. What time do you get up in the morning? Twenty half past three and quarter to four. Sure. And go to bed half past ten. I'm a porridge man. Porridge and tears. Porridge twice a day. Yeah. No meat, no sugar, no tea. Nothing no more. Do you fear death yourself? No. 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 When my father in heaven think I ain't no more use and a nuisance to anybody, he'll take me home. Yeah. Oh, my father comes. 